tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And I don't know, this is just kind of that physical place where the name of the Lord, for me, all of my life, this has been that place. It's never changed. And uh, there's something special about it. In fact, I, I'm sure I'll kind of miss this place when we move on. But uh, I'm grateful for the house of the Lord and the family of God. There's nothing like having God's people, God with skin on. You know, sometimes it's difficult to touch in that spirit realm. And uh, I just want to say this. Uh, I don't know where you are and your thoughts uh, had run the gamut today just thinking you, life happens fast. And uh, I, I came in here today and just walked back and forth in this altar area, the place that is, I've found comfort and solace so many times. And I just began to feel after the Lord because my mind was going so many different directions. And uh, it was kind of like Elijah. I didn't feel him in in fear and crying out I didn't feel him you know in the whirlwind I didn't feel him and every time I would just I didn't know where to find him and every time I began to just a song would come to my mind and I begin to sing the words of an old song and I would feel the presence of the Lord come over me I'm like God it took me a few times to recognize and then I'd wander off of that back into praying about the needs and the things that are going on and I'm sure that God was listening brother Ralph but I'm telling you when I touched on praise and when I began to say you alone are holy you alone are worthy and then I would feel the spirit of the Lord come over me I'm like okay that's where it is God is in he inhabits the praises of his people whether you're on the mountaintop or in the valley God is with you God is there I'm so grateful for that I know brother Grant and others have maybe been updating you a little I just got a text a few minutes ago since church started from sister Lashley she said that Jeffrey is back in the room and settled in they gave him some morphine but it's not touching his pain they said they can give him some oxycodone in about 30 minutes so just pray that they can get his pain under control and keep him comfortable tonight I wonder if you just pray with me real quick that God would do that father we thank you for what you're already done we trusting that you're going to complete what you've started but we ask right now God that you'd stretch forth your hand of mercy send the ministering angels of heaven into that room right now let the peace of God that passes understanding rest upon our pastor let strength fill his body let the virtue of the Lord minimize that pain oh God bring it under control by the word of the almighty God we ask it in Jesus name in Jesus name amen 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 I want to talk to you tonight about something uh, interestingly sister Lashley called me last night later and uh, let me know what was going on and as it began to progress throughout the night, late into the night, I realized that there was a good chance that pastor wasn't going to, I, I thought, you know, you can go in the, they can do, we can work miracles, I thought, in the hospital, you know, they can give you something medicinal, they can, they can put medicine way down inside you, and I thought, this is just something small, it's going to pass, he'll be back on his feet, and then as the night progressed, I realized that's probably not going to happen, so I sat down at the computer and began to just search and look and uh, think and bring some things together and God brought me to this um, message and so I just want to share with you what God put on my heart tonight and I believe that it touches <laughs> hindsight's 2020 I'll make that statement maybe later on but God just has a way of leading us to just the right thing and just the right word a word fitly spoken the scripture said it's like apples of gold in pitchers of silver. It is precious to the spirit. And in Job chapter 14 verse 1, the scripture states an inescapable fact of life. It said, man who is born of woman. Anybody here who was not born of woman? That means every one of us is of few days and full of trouble. And then that's not an isolated scripture. You know, the scripture tells us that uh, that we shouldn't basically take things out of context. No scripture is of private interpretation. In other words, in, in the Old Testament, and I believe it was carried over into the New Testament, said let every word out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. I believe that you can find principle upon principle upon principle to support the word of God supports itself. The New Testament comes along and echoes this same sentiment. James tells us that our lives are merely a vapor that quickly vanishes away. And Jesus emphatically states that in the world, you shall have tribulation. 
regardless of your station in life, whether you're young or old, rich or poor, saint or sinner, we all have one thing in common. That is from time to time, we are all going to face the storms of life. Just as God is no respecter of persons, trouble is no respecter of persons. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 45, Jesus said, God makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So being a believer or even having great faith doesn't exempt you from life's problems and trials. They indeed come to us all. Oh, but I thank be unto God that we don't have to face it alone. There is an advantage to being a believer. Come on, somebody. You don't have to go the storm alone. We have someone to turn to. When this world don't know where to turn, they're hopeless. We've got the word of God, and we've got the God of the word. Hallelujah. I'm thankful he's not in a grave somewhere, but he is alive and on the throne with all power in heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The psalmist writes, and I love the psalms. In fact, today, I, I have a normal, regular program that I read, but today I just needed some encouragement. So I got the trusty old study Bible that mom and dad gave me years ago that's got tons of highlights in it. I didn't go to anywhere particular. I just started at the beginning of psalms and started reading the highlights because those are the things that have spoken to me before. And let me tell you, if God's spoken to you before, his word never changes. It's the same yesterday, hallelujah, today and forever. It's forever settled if it was ever ever hope in it. Come on, there's hope today. There's peace today. There's comfort today. One note writer said of the Psalms, he said, no other book of the Bible so totally expresses the full range of human emotion and needs in relation to God and human life. And so the psalmist says in Psalm 61 2, from the end of the earth I will cry to you. And when my heart is overwhelmed, just lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Come on, that rock of ages. It's that cliff, that place of hiding for you and I. There is power in knowing that when my little boat is sinking, Jesus is there. When I am on the waves of life, tossed to and fro, Jesus is there, and he's there to rescue me. He's not just there watching. He's not some idol that can't see or hear, says it over and over in Scripture, but he is a God who is involved in the life of his children. So tonight I want to speak to you from this title, Sensing God in the Storm. Sensing God. We know that he's there, but sometimes I can't feel him. Perhaps I'm feeling in the wrong place. Maybe I'm having a pity party and God's not in the pity party. Come on, but I want to learn how to sense God in the storm. In a Peanuts cartoon, Charlie Brown was admiring a sandcastle he had created on the beach. And just then it was leveled by a downpour of rain. And as he looked at the sand where his artwork had once proudly stood, he said, there must be a lesson in here somewhere. I just don't know what it is. Can you relate? Yeah. I can say from personal experience that the phrase hindsight is 2020 is never more true than in the storms of life. For some reason, it seems nearly impossible to see the good in the midst of the storm. When I look back, I can see what God was doing so often. Not always, but most of the time. However, brothers and sisters, it's the storms of life that God uses to reveal things about us. See, we often have difficulty admitting our own flaws. James 5.16 instructs us to confess or to acknowledge our faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. I want you to know this is not to rub our nose in our weaknesses. That's not God's purpose at all. But in order to be healed or in order to be changed, step one is that I've got to confess. I've got to acknowledge that I've got a weakness, that I've got a problem. How often do we want to lean into our strengths? But he said, lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways, in your weaknesses, in your faults, in your failures, acknowledge him. So since we often refuse to acknowledge, God sends a storm. And he forces us to acknowledge our weakness. Tell your neighbor, so we may be healed. 
God's got a purpose. God's working. God's always working. God never wastes an opportunity in the good times and in the bad. In fact, in the bad times is when God's mostly taking us to school. It's the school, one of my favorite phrases, Jeff Foxworthy, comedian, he said, the school of hard knocks is not the highest institution of learning, but it's the only school a fool will attend. And how many times have we been foolish in life, brothers and sisters? We could have learned from those that went before us. We probably even heard not to or to do this or that, but in our own stubborn foolishness, we end up there, the school of hard knocks. Let me say here that every storm in life is not sent from God. Some storms are purely of our own making. If you curse the boss, get fired, and have financial difficulty, you can thank yourself for that mess. But can I tell you that even then, God's grace is still sufficient? God's grace takes into account our faults. God's grace takes into account our failures. And if we confess our, and acknowledge our weaknesses and pray, God will heal us. God will restore us. God will make a way. Remember this, stress and pressure is God's way of identifying our faults and weaknesses. So the storms of life are to reveal some things about us. Number one, it reveals the nature of my faith. Is my faith in God, truly in God? Or, again, am I leaning into my own abilities, my own strengths? I don't want to get bogged down here, but I got to say this. I... Something that resonated in my spirit so much years ago, we went through the Purpose Driven Life, Pastor Rick Warren. One thing that resonated in me out of that book, it just kind of was an affront to me, I think, because it was so revealing of something in me. And he says in the book that people, most people do not identify with us in our strengths. But the vast majority of people you talk to will fully identify with you in your weaknesses. In fact, it's, di it's difficult from a ministerial perspective, and I'm not talking from pastoral, I'm talking of anyone, you, you witnessing to others. When you start talking about your strengths, you're very well going to alienate people. But when you start talking about your weaknesses, you invite them in. There's something about the humility before honor comes humility, and when we humble ourselves before God and give that thing that we think is useless, that part of us, we lean into that, and a lean into God, he takes and makes it. So stress and pressures of life, they reveal the nature of my faith. Secondly, it reveals the strength of my commitment. Am I committed come what may? Or just when it's smooth sailing? Just when it's convenient? Am I committed to the kingdom of God? Am I committed to worship? Am I committed to prayer? Am I committed to the word of God? Am I committed to a holy and righteous life? Come on. Thirdly, it reveals the level of my spiritual maturity. This is a tough one. When life happens, how do I respond? Somebody said one time, life is 10% what happens and 90% how I respond to it. Brothers and sisters, we have no control over the things that come into our life. But we have 100% control over how we respond to that. It is so telling because that response is 100% on me. And that's 90% of my life. I'm in, and so you can break it down. I'm in control of 90% of life if I can respond in a proper way. Do I demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit? Jesus said that we would be known by our fruits, not by the clothing that we wear, the name that we call upon, the, the words that we profess, not the talk we talk, but the walk that we walk. It reveals the level of my spiritual maturity, and finally, it reveals the measure of my teachability. It doesn't matter where your level of spiritual maturity is today, you can grow and you can, you can become more and more like him. In fact, I believe that we will until the day we die. Progression through the school of life is mastery-based. Failure is not final. So learn from your past mistakes because you will take them again.
It's mastery-based. You're not going to move on to the next level. They're not just going to pass you along because you got most of it right. God is going to be, he's the taskmaster. What is it that I, the scripture talks about? The law being that schoolmaster. The word of God is there. It's that perfect law of liberty. When I think that I've arrived, I begin to read the word of God. I realize I've still got so far to go, but God's grace is sufficient. So it reveals the measure of my teachability. I want to stay teachable. I want to, I want to keep an open ear. I don't ever want to get to the place that I feel like I've arrived It doesn't matter where we are in our walk with God. We can always grow more like him. So tonight we're going to briefly take a look at this angle. What do I learn and receive from the storms in life? So take a look at me. Look with me at Matthew chapter 14. Where Jesus' disciples encounter a literal storm on the Sea of Galilee. In Matthew 14, 22 through 33, Jesus has just fed the 5,000, the multitude. And the Bible says in verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. I love every time I read that. Peter walked on the water to go. Peter gets a lot of slack because of he, he's kind of up and down a little bit. The, what do we call him? The disciple with the shoe-shaped mouth. I mean, there's a lot of gigs at Peter. He's the only man other than Jesus that ever walked on water, friend. I'm telling you, Peter had something. He said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. (laughs) We're not so different, are we? We too vacillate so quickly from, Lord, bid me come to, Lord, save me. I'm, I'm in over my head here. We get this moment of inspiration and we're ready to charge hell with a five-gallon bucket of water. And then let life start happening and we find ourselves overwhelmed. I need you, Jesus. Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. I love it. Twice in here he says, Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The first thing I want you to note is that the disciples had done nothing wrong to encounter this storm. In fact, in fact, they were simply obeying the word of Jesus. Get in the boat and go to the other side. It's sometimes easier to understand the storms that come because we are out of the will of God. A perfect example is the Old Testament prophet Jonah. Because he disobeys God, he encounters a storm, ultimately is thrown overboard and winds up in the belly of a whale. Another example in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, they deliberately lied to the Holy Ghost. And as a result, they lost their lives. But what about those storms that come when we know, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we got the word of God and we are in the perfect will of God. Again, Matthew 14, tells us that Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. The King James Version says he constrained them. The Amplified Bible says he directed them. Regardless of what word you use, you get the picture. They were, at, they were there at the word of the Lord. And the point is this, brothers and sisters, just because you encounter a storm in this life doesn't mean that you're out of the will of God. What about Job? Job 1 and 8, listen to this description. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Yet Job's life was the epitome of trials and testing. 
What about the Apostle Paul? In 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, he writes from the New Living Testament, Five times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers, from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I have faced dangers from men who claim to be believers. But are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty. I've often gone without food, and I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. What I'm saying, child of God, is it's possible for you to be obeying God right in His perfect will and in the same time encounter a horrific storm. Don't let the enemy tell you just because something's breaking bad in life that you've broken bad. Come on. It rains on the just and on the unjust the scripture is full of examples in fact it would be hard pressed to think of someone that the scripture tells much about that isn't an example of this joseph was wrongfully imprisoned shadrach meshach and abednego cast into the fiery furnace john the baptist was beheaded and in luke 7 28 jesus said among those born of women there is not a greater prophet than john the baptist In the Old Testament, it was Job, none like him. In the New Testament, it was John the Baptist, none like him. Yet they were persecuted. And in our text, we have Jesus' disciples in full obedience, yet in a storm. So I want us to look closely at this story because I I believe found therein are a couple of lifelines of hope, brothers and sisters, that we can hold fast to when when we are floundering too. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when we find ourselves floundering in our own stormy seas of life. Matthew 14, again, verses 24 and 25. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the water. So what does Jesus do in the midst of my storm? Lifeline number one, brothers and sisters, Jesus will come to you. You don't have to go looking for him. He's there waiting for you just to call his name. I'm thankful that he's not an aloof God. I'm thankful that he's not out of reach God, but he enters into our storm. He doesn't stand on the outside and call to us and coach us, but God gets right in there with us. In Malachi chapter 3, God is likened to a refiner of silver. I want you to listen to how one silversmith defined the refining process. He said, I must sit with my eyes steadily fixed on the furnace. For if the time necessary for refining is exceeded in the slightest degree, the silver will be injured. Woo, that brings a whole new life to where he said, I will not suffer you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear, but I will, with the temptation, make the way for your escape. Brothers and sisters, you've got the word of God. He will make a way. He said, I can't allow it to exceed the slightest degree because the silver will be injured. He said, I never take my eye off the silver in the furnace. I do not want to take it out too early. Because if I take it out too early, it won't be purified. Yet if I leave it in too late, it will be injured. So when asked how he knew it was ready, he replied, I know the silver is pure when I can see my face reflected in it. Ooh, come on, somebody. That's God's greatest desire for you and me. That's why we go through the trials and the testings of life. It's that purifying process. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 4.19, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. That's the goal. That's always been the goal. That always will be the goal. Our God is not on a quick rescue mission. Come on, somebody. He's working a work, and he's going to purify us. His will is to purify us till he is formed in us. I want you to know when Jesus comes. (laughs) He comes to us at the darkest hour. Verse 25 said that he came in the fourth watch of the night. The fourth watch is sometime between 3 and 6 a.m. Brother Mike, those wee hours of the morning when it seems like you're alone. It's the darkest time. Nobody else is awake. Anybody can relate? Is that when the enemy wakes you up, starts knocking, starts stirring? Come on. Jesus is there. The darkest hour 
is just before dawn. Jesus wasn't apathetic. He was right on time. Also, I want you to note that when he comes to us, he comes to us demonstrating his victory over our greatest fears. Verse 25 said, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. The very thing that was frightening them, the very thing that was tossing them around, Jesus put it under his feet. Come on, child of God, what's the worst that hell can do to us? Kill us? Come on, Jesus rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Again, that's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? He is triumphant. He has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. And has promised us life evermore. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah writing in chapter 43 Verses 1 through 3, such a beautiful message of hope that we can lay hold to. He said, but now thus saith the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. Yeah, it may get deep. Yeah, you may feel the buffeting of the, of the current, but it shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame even scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Brothers and sisters, we've got a confidence. We've got a hope. Our God is there. Whether you're in the storm or on the mountaintop, he's with you. You're still in his hand. So he comes to us in the midst of the storm. Lifeline number two, though, I'm thankful that he doesn't just come to us. He ministers to our need. I don't want a God that just walks along besides me and allows me to stumble, like thinking of the, the poem, Footprints. When I saw just one pair, I thought I was alone. But looking back, I realized he had actually picked me up and carried me. Hallelujah. He's there to minister to my need. In verses 26 and 27, the Bible says, When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Oh, please hear me tonight, somebody. If you don't get anything else, you got to get this. There is something deeply soothing and comforting about the voice of the Lord. If you have yet to discover this, friend, you are living beneath your privilege. You are so missing out on one of the greatest benefits of being a child of God. And furthermore, can I tell you, the loudest, most accessible, present, and powerful voice of God in the earth today is the written word of God. And you can carry it with you everywhere you go. You don't have to find your way into a Pentecostal altar. Friend, you can make an altar wherever you are. The word of God, the written word of God, there's so much hope, solace, and comfort in here. If you desire the peace of God that passes understanding, that joy that's unspeakable and full of glory, I implore you, don't just read it, but study it. Come on, highlight it, underline it, memorize it. The psalmist said that its words are sweeter than honey and more precious than gold. And then he declares, I will hide its words. I will memorize it. I'm going to hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Perhaps one of the greatest sins is to forget the word of the Lord. In the midst of the storm, I want to hear the voice of God. There's many voices that are speaking to us, brothers and sisters. I talked to Sister Lashley today and she said, I, I keep so many scenarios keep coming in my mind as pastor was in surgery. But she said, I keep telling God, nope, I'm not going there. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to trust the word of God. Brothers and sisters, we've got a choice. It's 100% on you and I. You've got a choice. You can believe what word you hear. The doctor had, we didn't let this out, but the doctor had said, this could be cancer. We may have to put a stoma in. He may have a colostomy bag. Said, I'm not believing that report. I'm not even repeating that report. Until it is, it ain't. And God's in control, and he's the one who's going to determine yay or nay. I don't want to forget the word of the Lord. When I'm fearful and anxious, he's those words of comfort and hope. When I'm lost and I don't know where to turn, he's that guide and compass and shows me the way. And when I'm wrong, 
It's the word of God that corrects me. It instructs me. God is good. Whatever you need, brothers and sisters, you're going to find it in the word of God. You're going to find it in the word of God. I want you to note also that he ministers to us in spite of our misunderstandings and in spite of our fears. When Jesus arrives, the disciples mistake him for a ghost and they cried out in fear. But Jesus didn't abandon them just because they were afraid or just because they couldn't figure out that it was him coming to them on the water. Can I tell you that you don't have to figure it all out. That's his job. We just got to trust that he will figure it all out. Well, come on, somebody. In fact, he doesn't just figure it out. He works it out. <laughs> I'm glad I got a God that gets involved in things. Hallelujah. He's working on my behalf. Hallelujah. So take heart, child of God. God's got today and tomorrow just like he had yesterday and the day before. Hallelujah. And everything, everything is going to be all right. How do you know this, Brother Lashley? Because I've heard his voice. And he told me so. I've got the word of God. He told me so. Romans 8, 28, we all quote it, but do we all really believe it? And we know that all things, somebody say all things, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Why do we know it? Because God said it. And God is faithful. He cannot deny it. He cannot. That's his nature. He cannot deny his nature. In Hebrews 4, 15, the writer of Hebrews makes us to know that God empathizes with our suffering. He doesn't just sympathize. He empathizes. In order to empathize with someone, you've had to walk in their shoes. You've had to be where they are. And he says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points. Somebody say all points. In everything, he was tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Listen to how Mr. J.B. Phillips translates that verse. He says, for we have no superhuman high priest to whom our weaknesses are unintelligible. He himself has shared fully in all of our experience of temptation, except that he never sinned. In closing, I want you to listen to this excerpt from Max Licato's book, In the Eye of the Storm, about that verse. Max writes, the writer of Hebrews is adamant almost to the point of redundancy. It's as if he anticipates our objections. It's as if he knows that we will say, God, it's easy for you up there, but you don't know how hard it is from down here. So he boldly proclaims Jesus' ability to understand. Look at the wording again in Mr. Phillips' translation. He himself, not an angel, not an ambassador, not an emissary, but Jesus himself. He shared fully, not partially, not nearly, not to a degree, but entirely. Jesus shared fully in all of our experience. Every hurt, every ache, all the stresses and all the strains, no exceptions. Come on, somebody hear me. No substitutes. Why? Just so that he could empathize with our weaknesses. <laughs> Would somebody like to lift your hands and thank him? Oh, hallelujah. That he knows where I am. He really, really understands where I am. There's not a single hair that falls from your head that he doesn't know about where I am. Hallelujah. He knows the very details of every portion of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you stand with me? It's so good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm so grateful for the presence of God. I pray you know that God knows exactly where you are. He knows where pastor is. He knows where we are. And I'm trusting God. I told somebody, you know, I, I've been kind of really hard lately on the fact that we are blessed. And I think sometimes we don't get it. And I couldn't help but wonder as the text messages were going out today about what was going on in pastor, if the naysayers were saying, uh-huh, 
how you feel about that now, Brother Lashley. I want to tell you how I feel about it. The same scriptures that I quote to you for encouragement, I quote to me for encouragement. The same God that I run to for your encouragement, I run to me for encouragement. He's still on the throne. Life, one of my favorite scriptures, all of my days, the scripture says, are written in his book. Today was written in his book. He knew before I got up this morning what was going to happen today. And what's more, he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He's got it all in his hand. He stamped his stamp of approval on it. And if he did, friend, I can face it because he's going to be there with me. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we're so grateful for your presence. Thank you for your word. It truly is a lamp unto our feet. God, it's not that spotlight showing us way out there, but it's today. You're showing me right where I am and where to take the next step, God. And I'm trusting that you're there. Just like you were there yesterday, you're going to be there today and tomorrow. Lord, we put pastor in your hands we put all of these things that are happening in your hands our lives God they're in your hands we trust you fully we're going to walk on in faith trusting you Lord what come what may God you're in control and you are working it for our good I pray that you would encourage and strengthen this body of believers God let us continue to walk not be distracted but walk in the purpose of the Lord walk in the goodness of God Lord you've got a calling upon our lives Help us to walk worthy of that calling, not be distracted by the things of this life, Lord, but to see your will accomplished in us and through us is our greatest desire. Thank you, Lord, and to God be the glory in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I don't know about you. To me, sometimes it feels almost sacrilegious to go from an environment like this, knowing pastor's laying in a hospital bed, and we're going to celebrate mama. But I'm telling you what, friend. If you were to ask pastor, he'd say, celebrate on. This coming Sunday, mom will be 80. You'll be joining the octogenarian club, as Brother Suey often calls it. And uh, we're excited with her. And uh, I'm sure Sunday we'll uh, have the musicians and we'll sing on her birthday. But we've got a celebration. The ladies have prepared refreshments and decorated and just want to have a time of fellowship. We thought Wednesday night would be perfect. We're getting out a little early. It's 810. And so take a few moments, fellowship with one another. Greet Mother Lashley. Wish her a happy birthday. And uh, God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.